Hello everyone and welcome once again to Reading Culture and to our continued look at the Old English epic Beowulf uh, using the translation of Dr. Waterlyza. Where we last, last left off, Beowulf and his men had just arrived in Denmark, fully armed and ready to fight the monster Grendel, um, the creature to which we were introduced at the very beginning of the poem. In the lines that we'll look at today, we will see, really, at least immediately, the introduction of the hero, the eponymous character himself, Beowulf, and maybe get a sense as to what kind of a character we are dealing with here. All right, so if we uh, begin where we left off last time, namely at uh, about lines 226, right, we are seeing that uh, again, the troops are arriving in this, this uh, fully armed manner. Right, we get this long description of you know, their mail shirts and their battle garments. And then we get the introduction uh, of the watchman. And this is at about line 230 or so. It says, When from the wall, the shooting's watchman, whose duty it was to watch the sea cliffs, saw them bear down the gangplank, bright shields ready battle gear. He was bursting with curiosity in his mind to know who these men were. It's very common in Anglo-Saxon uh, culture and Old English poetry to use violent imagery for the emotions, particularly emotions like anger or fear, but even here we have, at least in translation, curiosity. And there's a sense of it's just bursting out of him, right? This is, this is a, a very common kind of thing. And uh, one of the reasons that we'll see is uh, that this is a society, we've talked about this before, right? it's a tribal society, right? often based on feud. In other words, strangers showing up on your shore, especially fully armed strangers, is not necessarily right, an innocuous happening. And so we get the um, arrival of Beowulf himself, and we get our first impression of him, it really at least is coming through the eyes of the watchman himself. So at line 249 or so, or maybe 246, uh, we uh, see this reaction from the, the watchman who says, I have never seen a greater earl on earth than that one among you, that one being Beowulf, a man in war gear. That is no mere courtier, honored only in weapons, unless his looks belie him, his noble appearance. We get this sense that Beowulf is, is princely in bearing, uh, right? But there's this question of, well, why does he then come to Denmark? Hmm. Well, we see right off the bat the, the lack of courtesy uh, in, in many ways from the Coast Guard. So right after that, he says, uh, Now I must know your lineage, lest you go hence as false spies. Travel further into Danish territory. Right. So the Coast Guard really accuses them uh, appropriately of being false spies. This is a greeting which Beowulf will note later in the poem when he indicates that he did not have a good greeting. A good reception when he arrived, even though he's arrived for the purposes of fighting uh, this monster for them. So in reaction to this, what's really an accusation, Beowulf has to respond, and he has to respond by identifying himself, which he does uh, at about line 263 or so. Uh, so he starts off by saying, we are men of the Yatis nation and Helax, earth companions. My father was well known among men a noble commander named Edgthau. He saw many winters before he passed away, ancient from the court. Nearly everyone throughout the world remembers him well. Right, so we get this identification of Edgthau as part of Beowulf identifying who he is, and he's identifying his fame, the fame of his father. Now, his father is not a king. However, we will find out, uh, if you can kind of piece out these references, that he's become attached to the Hrethling dynasty, where the kings of the yachts, Hrethel's uh, younger son, Hjallak, is the king of Jotland, and uh, king of the yachts, and he is the king of Beowulf. Uh, and Beowulf's father, Edgthau, married the only daughter of Hrethel, and that's how they became uh, intertwined. So he's related to the king, um, though he's not a king himself. But we get this sense um, that, nevertheless, Edgthau is this kind of great, well-known, heroic character. And so by Beowulf identifying himself as being the son of this character, he is placing himself in that kind of lineage. Moreover, what we see here is this use of 
uh, words to identify one's lineage as being uh, a way of establishing identity. So right before that, we actually have this great line where it says the eldest one among them. So we get a sense that maybe these are young men, leader of the troop unlocked his word hoard. So this is a very evocative image, the idea that like a hoard of gold. So uh, a man has a hoard of words, which you can kind of unlock, unleash all of these all of these words. Um, there's a sense that they have power, right? And they have, they, they form the identity of the person. And we'll see there's a lot of, although there's a lot of physical violence in the story, especially between the hero and the monster, there's also a lot of uh, the interactions between persons uh, in the purely verbal realm. And indeed the language used by the characters, um, even when looking at it in translation, is always very important. So if we uh, go on a little bit here, we'll see uh, one of the things that Beowulf will do quite often, which is, uh, uh, well, he'll, he'll utter nomic statements, but we see it's also uttered in this particular instance by the watchman. So this is uh, at about line 286, maybe. The watchman spoke as he sat on his horse, a fearless officer. A sharp shield warrior must be a judge of both things, words and deeds, if he would think well. This is what we call a gnomic statement, that is, a proverbial statement of received wisdom. Right? And it was particularly important part of old English heroic literature, right? the idea of the utterings of these statements, of these, these kind of ancient wise truths. Here it seems that he's basically saying is that right, a, a wise person, a wise man, should be able to not only judge words, because we've seen Beowulf, you know, uh, right, say these these words to introduce himself, but also of deeds. So the, the, both are important, and we're going to see this throughout this question of when do the deeds and the words not line up, and when do they? And do they line up in the case of Beowulf, generally speaking, at least? In any case, this speech is enough to at least move them forward, and so they uh, are ultimately able to proceed. And we get this description. Uh, this is around lines three hundred three to three hundred six of uh, uh, of their uh, armor and uh, their kind of outfitted battle gear. It says, boar figures shone over gold-plated cheek guards, gleaming fire-hardened that guarded the lives of the grim battle-minded. And uh, Dr. Leozo provides a note for this, noting that the boar was a sacred image in Germanic mythology. In his Germania, the Roman historian Tacitus mentions warriors bearing boar images into battle. Images of boars were placed on helmets to protect the wearer from the bite of the sword, which was often quasi-personified as a serpent. Archaeologists have unearthed several Anglo-Saxon helmets with various kinds of boar images on them. So here we get the sense of this, this image of the boar. Is, it's just one of warlike fierceness, right, meant to frighten the enemies in battle. And we'll see these, these images of um, of, of, of war and of the beasts of battle uh, throughout uh, the poem, and we'll, we'll note them when we come across them. But this description ultimately culminates in their arriving at the hall of Hero, where they are greeted by, uh, it seems kind of like the, the warden or the guardian of the hall, Wolfgar. Uh, and here we get uh, an example of both the custom of normal, normal uh, or no, at least no, normal and noble uh, context, noble courtesy and formal interaction as well. Uh, as in the section uh, about 356 to 610, right, we get a, uh, uh, a long discourse between the characters, which we don't really have time to look at in too much depth here. But one of the things that's perhaps worth noting, this is, so if you look at, uh, say, 359, for instance, uh, right, we, we get this sense that Right, we, uh, or actually, maybe just before that, uh, this is Wolfgar that's referring to. He hastily returned to where Frothgar sat, old and gray-haired, with his band of earls. He went boldly, stood by the shoulder of the Danish king. He knew the noble custom. Wolfgar spoke to his friend and lord. There have arrived here over the sea's expanse, come from afar, men of the yachts. The chief among them, the warriors, called Beowulf. They bring a request, my lord, that they might be allowed to exchange words with you. Do not refuse them your reply, gracious Hrothgar. In their war trappings, they seem worthy of noble esteem. Notable indeed is that chief who has shown these soldiers the way hither. So, what we see here, 
in this section of the narrative are some aspects of the, uh, you could say, historical historical aspect of the poem, right? That is to say that you have this right nephew of the Yatish, the king, the king of the Yats, who seems possibly semi-historical. Right? He appears in some other more historical sources. And meeting, again, Hrothgar, who may have some kernel, however slight, possibly, of uh, historical basis. But, and we also see very much, uh, right, there's, there's this tension, again, between various kingdoms and tribes and what have you. Almost, in this case, we are in a very kind of historical realm. But we're also, this semi-historical or pseudo-historical aspect is also meeting the fairy tale aspect. Because remember, this is the hero coming to, for all intents and purposes, the haunted hall, the hero with the grip of 30 men come to dispel this monster who he's told has fatally withstood all who have foolishly fallen into his grasp. So here we see this kind of tension almost, you could say, throughout the poem. I mean, that, right, in some ways it's a very historical story in a very historical world, but this, this world of the fairy tale is also embedded in it as well. Now, in terms of this historical background, we see again in 372 that there's a whole history here that we don't necessarily know or we don't get much in the text. Right, Hrothgar speaks and says, I knew him when he was nothing but a boy. His old father was called Ejthiau, to whom Hratholiat gave in marriage his only daughter. Now his daring son has come here, sought a loyal friend. And, and then there's a note here that mentions that Hrathol was a father of Hilak and the grandfather of Beowulf. So, Beowulf. so again, Beowulf and the king are cousins, right? They have the same grandfather through because Beowulf's father married the daughter of the king Hrathol, whose son Hilak is now on the throne. Uh, right, and we we know that somehow uh, Hrothgar knew Beowulf as a boy, and so we get a sense of the relationship between King Hrothgar and Beowulf as being established. But there seems to be perhaps a whole story there as to why, you know, Edgethal had to take refuge there at one point with Hrothgar when he was younger. And we don't know the full background of this. It's possible that the original audience for this would have that there was a whole body of heroic literature that we simply don't have access to. But also what we see here is that this background of Beowulf's father marrying the only daughter of a king, it's again, it seems to exist in kind of a historical context and to a degree, right? This is a kind of dynastic thing that we see here between kingdoms. But it also, again, has that hint of the fairy tale, right? The hero who marries the only daughter of the king. So it's all of these things are at play here. Also, we see a little bit further on, uh, actually just uh, right after where I left off, seafarers in truth have said to me, those who brought to the yachts gifts and monies as thanks, that he has 30 men's strength, strong in battle in his hand grip. So a couple of things to note here. One is the sense that th these gifts need to be given as security for peace and what could otherwise be potentially hostile parties. Uh, the background's a bit too much to get into, but uh, basically it seems that quite possibly the sister of Hrothgar is married to uh, Onela, king of the Swedes, and that the Swedes are at uh, at odds, you could say, with the Ots. So it's not clear where the Danes would necessarily be in that relationship. Um, but of course, the other uh, reference we have in that passage I just read of, is this possession of the strength of 30 men that Beowulf has, right? And that this, again, this is a fairy tale element, the hero who has the strength of 30 men. So it's not a straightforward kind of historical hero, uh, but it does have links beyond the normal fairy tale hero as well, who doesn't have a whole lineage that is tied into a bunch of historical political battles. And that uh, situation politically is what leads to this next reference here uh, about line 397, where they are told that now you may go in in your war gear under your helmets to see Hrothgar. Let your battle shields and deadly spears await here the result of your words. So they are allowed to go in in a lot of their armor and even it seems their swords, but they have to leave their shields and spears outside the hall, right? Lest violence erupt, because although you could do damage to the sword, to fight a proper battle in a hall, you would want your spears and your shields. So we get the sense of this very precarious situation where, you know, trust is not necessarily always there and violence is lurking all the time. So how does Beowulf introduce himself? Well, at about line 407 or follow, uh, and following, he gives a long speech, uh, which I won't get into too much here, but it's, it's certainly worth reading. And it's a question, I think, as to is he, uh, is he boasting in this introductory speech that he makes? Now, at this point, it's 
perhaps useful to get a sense of the cultural situation, uh, right, and, and establish that situation so that we understand what it is that Beowulf is doing. So here Beowulf is, uh, amongst other things, uh, stating what he will do, what he has done. Um, and in many ways in this culture, it's not considered boasting to, at least not in that kind of mo modern pejorative sense, to really give an account of who you are and what you're here to do and what you're going to do. Uh, but it certainly does tell us something about Beowulf's character, nevertheless, the kind of confidence that he has. So we'll maybe look at a few of these, a uh, few of the points in the speech in a little bit more detail. But he is going to indicate his business in uh, Denmark, namely the fight Grendel. Right, he notes, this is at about line 413 to 414, that right, this, this most excellent of halls, he calls it, uh, Herod, right, stands idle and useless to every man after evening's light is hidden under heaven's gleaming dome. So there's a sense that when all is dark under this dome of heaven, then this most glorious of all earthly halls is useless because of the power of Grindel. And Beowulf is going to indicate his uh, uh, capability in fending off this threat uh, by saying what he has already done. So at lines 419 to 420, for instance, he is talking about his strength. He says, uh, uh, well, actually, before he even gets to that, he goes back to indicate how he got here. And let's maybe go back to line 415 or so. He says, my own people advise me, the best warriors and the wisest men, that I should, Lord Hrothgar, seek you out, because they knew the might of my strength. They themselves had seen me, blood stained from battle, come from the fight, when I captured five, slew a tribe of giants, and on the salt waves fought sea monsters by night, survived that tight spot. Avenged the wetter's affliction, they asked for trouble, and crushed those grim foes. And now with Grendel, that monstrous beast, I shall by myself have a word or two with that giant. So here we see that uh, right Beowulf is uh, right is proving his, his his prowess by indicating that he's slain right giants, he's slain sea monsters, and particularly in this description of you know these beasts, we have more folk tale elements. So Beowulf again, he's given his lineage like a historical hero, but now he's more of the folk tale hero, right? Slaying sea monsters and giants. He, right, he's always operating in both worlds, and he claims then uh, a little bit thereafter that that he and he alone can defeat Grendel. Uh, so that's, this is at 4:30. Uh, uh, or maybe let's go back a little bit. Uh, to where I left off. From from you now I wish, ruler of the bright days, to request a single favor, protector of the shieldings, that you should not refuse, having come this far, protector of warriors, noble friend to his people, that I might alone, O my band of earls and this hardy troop, cleanse Herod. Right, so there's a sense that only he, or at least only he and his men, are capable of dealing with this threat. And then he goes on in a little bit more specifics at about 435 and following. He says, uh, or, or even just a bit before that, he says, I have also heard that this evil beast in his wilderness does not care for weapons. So too will I scorn, so that Hilak, my liege lord, may be glad of me to bear a sword or a broad shield, a yellow battle board. But with my grip, I shall grapple with the fiend and fight for life, foe against foe. Let him put his faith in the Lord's judgment, whom death takes. So we get this sense that maybe out of a feeling of fair play, Beowulf is going to decide to fight Grendel without a sword, uh, but rather to fight him hand to hand. He said, right, he, there's a sense that, that Grendel, again, doesn't even know how to use swords, so Beowulf won't use them either. Is this hubris, right? Is this, is this overweening pride or is, is this confidence? Again, is this fair play or honor? What exactly is it? Is this related to this sense of his name, meaning, you know, Wolf of the Bee, the bear that he fights without swords? But we have seen he use, uses swords against the sea monsters, so sometimes he uses them. But we'll see how that turns out for him in the three main uh, monster fights in the story. All right, and if we go on a little bit here, we uh, this is about... 443, actually, we're, we're pretty much right where I left off. He says, I expect that if he is allowed to win, that's Grendel, he will eat unafraid the folk of the Yachts in that war hall, as he has often done, the host of the Hrathmen. You'll have no need to cover my head. He will have it, gory, blood-stained, if death bears me away. He will take his kill, think to taste me. will dine alone without remorse, stain his lair in the moor, 
No need to linger in sorrow over disposing of my body. Right, we get that note uh, indicating that right the covering of a head was a burial custom, and so Beowulf is grimly joking that there will be no need to trouble with funeral expenses if Brindle wins this fight, uh, because they will have no head to bury. Uh, so that we a little bit of uh, of that kind of right dark uh, uh, humor there, uh, a little bit of dark irony, and uh, it also perhaps a bit more of a glimpse into Beowulf's character, right? the, the, the hero who laughs in the face of death. Uh, we're also going to get a little bit of foreshadowing with regards to this reference to you know, uh, the head if we look at what happens to uh, the Thane of Hrothgar, Ashera, when Grendel's mother comes a little bit later in the poem. All right, so we're about to get, uh, about after that, a uh, kind of conclusion of the speech which ends in a gnomic statement. So he said, so he's, he continues this uh, description of what will happen if, if Grendel wins. Send on to Hulak if battle should take me, the best battle dress which my breast wears. Finest of garments is Hrethel's heirloom, the work of Wayland. And you see that, you'll see the note there that Wayland was the legendary blacksmith of the Norse gods. The antiquity of weapons and armor add to their value. Um, and then he ends here by, weird always goes as it must. So what does that mean? Well, we get a nice long note by Professor Lizzo, which I will just note for you here, where he says that weird is the old English word for fate. It is sometimes quasi-personified, though apparently not to the extent that the goddess Fortuna was in Roman poetic mythology. The word survives via Shakespeare's Macbeth as the modern English word weird. So weird, not in the sense of just strange, but if you think of the weird sisters from Shakespeare's Macbeth, it's because they're the kind of fateful sisters more than just they're strange. But here, again, weird, often translated as fate, but ultimately it actually is related to um, the verb to be in Old English. So in other words, weird is really what happens. Um, so there's a sense in which this gnomic statement is rather tautologous, right? There's a sense of it having a tautology, uh, being a tautology insofar as to say, like, what happens um, always happens as it must. <laughs> what happens always happens as it happens. Kind of case or or ra, what will be, what will be. Um, or it is what it is, right? Th these kinds of things. But it seems like what he is getting at is just saying that there's an inevitability of the outcome, right? Beowulf knows what he can do and he will do his utmost to defeat Grendel, but in the end, the result will be what it will be. And so there's a sense of almost a fatalistic kind of what, you know, what happens, happens, and we can't really stand against it. All right, so moving on from there, we see Hrothgar responding to this, saying, for past favors, my friend Beowulf, and for old deeds, you have sought us out. So there's a sense that maybe Beowulf is doing this, at least in part, due to an indebtedness to Hrothgar, because Hrothgar harbored Beowulf's father, Edsthiau, when Edsthiau needed harboring. Um, but uh, that's not, it's not made explicit, but that's kind of lurking there. And then uh, a little bit later on, we also get a return to one of the, the things that we looked at in the last video. Uh, so this at line maybe 465, uh, Hrothgar says, I first, uh, then I first ruled the Danish folk and held in my youth this grand kingdom, city of treasures and heroes, and Herogar was was dead, my oldest brother unliving, Hjelfden is firstborn, he was better than I. So we get this sense of uh, the fact that Hrothgar was actually not the elder brother. It, he, he had an older brother, Heogar, who had been a king and who it seems passed away, but though he had sons, and these sons are still around, Hrothgar's nephews, but nevertheless, the throne passed to Hrothgar. This is a theme we will see very commonly throughout. The idea of the direct son of the king not inheriting and someone else inheriting, and this often leads to tensions. And again, this is the historical aspect of the poem, dealing with these kinds of dynastic issues. All right, so the speech of Hrothgar goes on. Uh, so we see at line 478, uh, this statement by Hrothgar where he says, God might easily put an end to the deeds of this mad enemy, right? Referring to Grendel, of course. So this is yet another reference to the deity, though it's not a very theological one. Again, we've talked about how Hrothgar will make these references, but we're not meant to take them as historical anachronisms, because, of course, this is, both, this is in a pre-Christian world, and yet, right, we'll see these references to the kind of monotheistic deity. But it seems to just be part of the kind of rhetoric of uh, of these these sorts of speeches. But ultimately, as we see, particularly maybe at uh, lines 489 to 490, um, where he talks about uh, 
the hull, or maybe even if you go back slightly before that, he's talking about the the, the effects after Grendel has arrived. He says how in the morning this meat hull, lordly dwelling, was drenched with blood. When daylight gleamed, the benches gory hull spattered and befouled. Befouled, I had fewer dear warriors, and death took them away. Now sit down at my feast, drink mead in my hall. The reward of victory as your mood urges. Uh, we're not really sure at this point how much confidence Hrothgar has in Beowulf, right? So he's describing these, you know, gory sights after these uh, fights, but nevertheless, uh, right, does he actually expect Beowulf to be victorious? We don't know. And it's possible that right after this, we see this testing by the character Unferth, which, again, if you look at the note, you'll see that his name means unpeace or unreason. Um, and that even though he's sitting at the feet of Hrothgar, this is probably um, a seat of honor, rather, actually, a seat of the feet of the king. And he basically says, Our Beowulf, aren't you the one who lost, went on this foolish uh, and dangerous swimming match with Breck on the open sea and lost? And there's a question here of whether or not he's simply being discourteous or whether he's performing the rule, uh, performing the role of a thule. So a thule was kind of something, something like, uh, almost like a gesture, but in a serious way. So he would judge the wisdom or the truth of statements, but also of men. And one of the things they would do is they would test visitors using words, something called fleeting. Fleeting is a formulaic testing through insults. The idea is you would test the person's wit and their ability um, using words by kind of having these back and forth uh, verbal sparring matches. So is he doing this or is he actually sowing discord? Beowulf responds quite seriously by accusing him of slaying his own kin. Again, probably another historical reference that we don't have the full story for. And what does this say about Beowulf's character that he responds in this way? Um, well, maybe, again, this is a formulaic type situation or maybe Beowulf responds beyond the proper means of the situation. We could maybe interpret it in both ways. But this is more of that, again, testing through words, although of course he will soon be tested physically. He also defends himself, right, by noting that the reason he lost this swimming match was due to uh, the attack of the sea monsters. And at 555 and following, we, we get this description of him slaying them saying that it was given to him to stab that monster with the point of my sword, my war blade, the storm of battle took away that mighty sea beast through my own hand. So again, swords are not always ineffective for Beowulf, although we'll see in a moment how that is going to go with Grendel. Um, we also get the continued in this continued speech of Beowulf another reference to Weird. This is at lines 472 to 473. He says, Weird, again, you can maybe translate that as fate, often spars, spares an undoomed man when his courage endures. And this seems illogical, right? So fate spares the man who is not fated to die. Um, but what it probably means rather is that he who is undaunted does not doom himself. And weird, that is to say that what which comes to be, uh, spares him as a result of that. So again, there's a sense that's not, all, there's, there's a kind of fatalism there, and uh, but there's also a sense in being able to trust in your own strength as well. And again, and it seems that these uh, these things that he is uttering, right, they're not boasts in a pejorative sense, but they're rhetorical statements of, of his, you know, his manly courage, and that we're not necessarily supposed to look on that as a character flaw. Um, but if we look ahead, we see at line 644, it's about 651, uh, this description of the all right, of Grendel's coming and it's inevitable, it's known to Hrothgar, so he retires from the hall to get ready for the fight. And uh, Beowulf starts getting ready, he hands his armor off to his servant. We see this is at line 673 that he's of a high enough social rank to have a servant who can take care of these kinds of things. And again, we get this sense that he is going to fight him uh, without swords, right? Grendel's ignorant of uh, the kind of civilized arts of war, so Beowulf won't use swords either. This threat, his threat is building and building and building, right? Uh, at 694, uh, we, we get the sense that, right, they heard that it said that savage death had swept away far too many of the Danish folk in that wine hall, right? So we're, we're waiting for this, uh, this attack. We get this sense also at line uh, 697 uh, that uh, the Lord gave a web of victory to the people of the Wetters, comfort and support, so that they completely overcame their enemy through one man's craft by his own might. So there's a sense that 
you think of a tradition of weaving, particularly in Anglo-Saxon culture, in which you'd have narratives woven on tapestry. So the idea that there's like a web of victory being woven by God, but also the might rests in Beowulf. So again, both things are are there. And it's important to remember that even though the story is essentially a pagan tale of heroic strength, uh, its author was writing for a medieval Christian audience. So finally, we get the arrival of Grendel. bursts into the hall, right? He eats one of the guys. He uh, grapples with Beowulf's swords so are completely ineffective against him, so none of the men can really do anything but Beowulf, who grapples with him. There's a sense that the, the, the noise outside is so great that either it's kind of unclear exactly what it's saying. It's about line six, uh, 769 or so that it seems like maybe there's like a wild, raucous party going, in, uh, going on inside. But ultimately, uh, Beowulf, uh, Beowulf's hand grip is too great even for Grendel. And Grendel flees out of the hall, leaving his arm behind him gripped in the grasp of Beowulf. So in this first test of Beowulf's might, he has lived up to his boasts, he has lived up to everything that he has said of himself, and he has defeated the monster Grendel. So we have here the end of the first section, if we want to divide it that way, the first monster fight of the poem. The hero is victorious over the monster, and the hall is saved, at least for now. But as we will see in the next video, all is still not well in the kingdom of Denmark.